Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Powered Podcast All-Star Livestream Series. I am your co-host slash moderator, Brother Bedford, and we definitely want to thank you for taking the time out of your life to come out of the noise, come out of the chaos, to spend an hour with us to hopefully get some... Uh, uh, there's an old song that was sung when I was growing up in the church, and there was a verse in it that said, is there a balm in Gilead? that could heal, the, that could make the wounded whole? Is there yes. a balm in Gilead to heal the sin-sick soul? So we're hoping and praying that this podcast, this hour that we're going to spend with you today in the midst of all of this chaos can be a balm to help heal some of the maladies that we're going with, all of the challenges that we're facing. That's what this podcast is designed for, to provide healing, education, motivation, inspiration. We, we pray that we've been doing our job by bringing you the best and brightest of Black America who truly love us. That's why they're committing their time to do this. They love us. And so we've been well edified throughout the entire series. And I'm extremely excited about tonight because this is a very timely conversation with two of probably my most favorite people on the planet with Dr. George C. Frazier and his beloved sister, Dr. Emma Frazier Pendleton. So what I need you to do is go ahead and hit that share button right now. Tell all of your friends, all of your family to come on out of all of the noise right now, come out of all of the chaos and let's spend an hour together with Dr. George C. Frazier and Dr. Emma Frazier Pendleton. What I also need you to do while you're doing that and everybody is coming on to the live stream, I need you to go ahead and type in your name and tell us where you're from in the comments section. Interesting, in the midst of all of this, we've still been getting people who are joining us from London, South Africa, Canada, uh, all across America. We're just in every state. I think when we look in the comment section, all the way from California to New York, all the way from Detroit, all the way down here in the South, in Atlanta, we are uh, bombarded with people saying how much they enjoy what we're doing and sharing where they're from. So go ahead and do that. The next thing that I need you to do is follow Dr. Frazier's fan page. If you're on Facebook, George Frazier's fan page, we need you to go ahead and hit that follow button. And there, that way you'll get notified for all of the upcoming podcasts that are coming, all of the new and exciting announcement that we have. And then of course, uh, being the leader that Dr. George C. Frazier is, he has a perspective on everything that's happening. So you wanna kind of tune into people who you know, love and trust that can help guide us through this very trying time. So this is a good place to be with people who truly love you. So we want you to go ahead and hit that follow button. If you're watching over on YouTube, we need you to go ahead and just subscribe to the channel and you'll get notified uh, immediately when we go live on YouTube, if that's your uh, preference to watch the podcast over there. All right. And then the last thing that you can do to make sure that you get notified is to go ahead and go to www.newblackpower.com. Give us your name and email. And then that way I can make sure that I'll I'll have the capacity to send you the links to all of the upcoming emails. Some people keep inbox me saying I'm not getting notified. And that's because you're not confirming. You have to confirm. We don't believe in spamming. In fact, spamming is against the law. So you have to fill in your name and email and then check your spam filter for the reply email from myself, Brother Bedford, and then just hit that confirm button and you'll receive all of the notifications. And you definitely wanna get notified with the two. We have a very powerful week tonight. We have Dr. Uh, Emma Frazier Pendleton on, but then this coming Thursday, we have uh, Dr. Terrence Cash on, and then Saturday, we have Dr. Kwa David Whitaker. So this is just a very rich week, and you should be here enjoying this. So without further ado, I want to put it over into the hands of, uh, of course, uh, one of the uh, probably thought leaders that most people know. Uh, we see his face all the time. Sometimes we confuse his name with Joe Frazier, the boxer. I've had people say, you mean the boxer when you're talking about George Frazier? I'm like, no. So then they go to YouTube and they begin to just overwhelm themselves with all of the information that's there for Dr. George C. Frazier. So I won't go through his bio. I'll just say that he's the father of the networking conversation. He's the founder of the Power Networking Conference, and he is now the leader of a new nation, Frasier Nation, that connects Black people in America to Black people all over the world. So without further delay, I want to turn you over to the Hall of Famer, Dr. George C. Frazier. Good evening, Brother Bedford. Now, I cannot um, express in words that I would like to capture right now how 
I am excited about this, this particular moment. This is the first time my sister and I have shared a podcast together. Um, she is my favorite youngest sister. <laughs> and um, she's actually the only youngest sister I have, but she's my favorite. I love her. She's the only person living today, brothers and sisters, uh, that has been with me from zero, and I'm now 75. Uh, you know, I probably shouldn't have said that uh, because that might give you a peek into what you think her age is, but she's really not that age, right? She's 37, and I know she looks, uh, you know, a, a little bit older than that, but, you know, makeup and hairstyles and eyeglasses and all of that help our sisters to look younger. No, she is a, an incredible human being. It is a joy. We're going to have a good time tonight because <clears throat> Emma and I and our families vacation together, and for two weeks, we never shut up. In fact, my wife, Nora Jean, of 47 years, says that the interesting thing about Emma and I being together is that it always feels like, in spite of the fact there are 15 people with us, that we're the only two people in the room, all right? So that's how much we chat and how much we laugh and how much we joke and how much we share. Uh, this is just tonight, an hour. It's going to be a drop in the bucket. Uh, the conversation will go fast. It is one of my favorite topics on earth. It is one that I certainly have been talking about for many, many years. My sister is an expert in it. She has an illustrious um, resume. I have not committed it to memory. And like a lot of the brothers and sisters on these podcasts, I have truncated it. And I've reduced it down to 15 pages. And she sent, me, she sent me 75 pages. But we just, you know, if I read her resume, as you've heard me say before, the hour would be over. So we don't want to do that. We want to hear from Emma and uh, welcome her. Um, for, so what I'm going to do first is, is a dramatic read. I'm going to do my best to do a dramatic read and then get into this incredible subject uh, that we have for you tonight. And again, this is about Emma. This is not about me. My job is just to facilitate with the proper questions to pull out of her and uh, the knowledge that she has and to unpack it. Uh, she does not have to answer. No one has to answer on this podcast in short quips, um, but they can say what they feel and say what they want, and they can take their time saying it uh, if, in fact, that's what they want to do. So let me let me properly introduce Dr. Emma Fraser Pendleton, who is an experienced productivity and accountability coach who specializes in transformation. She's an award-winning author, an ordained minister, an international speaker, and top achieving educator with 30 years of proven success in training school districts to maximize staff and student achievement and cultural competency uh, and innovative strategies to master academic learning. Dr. Fraser Pendleton is the co-author of the Amazon bestseller, Who Would Have Thunk It? This is a book that Emma and I co-wrote. Here it is. It's a children's book. The first adventure of the Fraser Foster kids. Emma called the, the, this book factitional. It's fictionalized, but there are a lot of facts in it. She has also been featured in several women's anthologies, Head Ladies in Charge and Extraordinary Women, released in March of 2018. Dr. Fraser Pendleton and me uh, were also featured in Exceptional People magazine as the dynamic duo. Highlights of her career and public service awards include designing and implementing a self-esteem program for women living in shelters. Her awards include the 2016 Power Networking Phenomenal Women's Award, the Barack Obama 2016 Presidential Award for Lifetime Achievement, and we, I think, are the only brother and sister to win this award together. I also 
uh, was presented uh, uh, by Barack Hussein Obama, the Lifetime Achievement Award. Um, she's also won the Distinguished Service uh, for Black Women Award uh, by BISA, B-I-S as in Sam A, Black Women in Sisterhood for Action. The Barnes Historical Society Queen's Legend Award, the Hugh O'Brien Youth Leadership Award, and the E. C. Reams Women's International Ministry Award, the New York Chapter for Dedication and Service to Women in Ministry. Dr. Emma Fraser Pendleton is also the recipient of several prestigious scholarships to attend Harvard University, uh, the Graduate School of Education. During her residency at Harvard, she designed and taught a master's level course on multicultural education. She is also, uh, has also served as a teaching fellow and adjunct member of the faculty at Harvard. Dr. Pendleton uh, was an advisor to the Dean's Advisory Council and Secretary of the Black Students Union at Harvard and a noted panelist on the International Forum for Changing Trends in Education. Um, that's just some of it, <clears throat> but we want to get on with the conversation. There could be a lot more. Emma, love you. Yes. Welcome. Good okay. seeing you. I would call you Dr. Fraser Pendleton, but, but I've been calling you Emma for <laughs> three quarters of a century, so we're going to stick with Emma tonight. <laughs> How you doing? I'm good. Hey, I'm good. good. I'm All good. Right. I'm good. All right. Well, you look gorgeous. I don't know. Either that's an incredible camera or you, someone came in and did one heck of a makeup job on you, right? You look beautiful. You really, Thank really you. Um, You're going to talk tonight about one of my favorite subjects of which I have at least five or six books there on my bookshelf. And that is how to utilize emotional intelligence to maximize your full human potential. Now, I know that's a big sentence. There's a lot to unpack in that sentence alone. Um, but won't you begin however you want to begin, wherever you want to begin? I want to say I am so delighted to be here tonight to have the opportunity to share the knowledge of emotional intelligence and its application in particular to minority black brown people who have been marginalized in this society. So when we talk about emotional intelligence, we always talk about this book. This is Travis Bradbury and Jean Graves book came out in 2009 and it turned the world upside down because it redefined what intelligence was. When I was at Harvard, I had the, the distinction of meeting and being in classes with Dr. Howard Gardner, who then was looking at seven new levels of intelligence because before it used to be around linguistic English skills and mathematical skills. But he opened up that and also turned the world of education around because he said, we are not recognizing the major, the major components that make up human development and the capacity to function at your highest level. He talked about inter and interdependence. He talked about musical skills. He talked about spiritual intelligence. He even came up with an eighth one, which is about health intelligence. So intelligence before was defined as IQ. That's what you were born with. That's what they thought. You have a certain IQ, you take a test, 120, you're a genius when you get past 140, up in 160. I think Einstein was in the 180s. And so once you had that IQ, and they defined it in school for us by standardized testing, they didn't give you an actual IQ test, but all of the standardized tests was to level the playing field to see where you fell on the continuum of intelligence and scholarship. 
So when this book came out, Emotional Intelligence, they blew the lid off of that theory because they said IQ does not define your ability to learn or to teach or to assume a position in society as one that is intelligent. Now, why that fact is so important for us as Black people is we traditionally score lower on standardized tests. That was the decades. I was in the system 35 years, actually. And so when I became a teacher and I would ask for certain books for my students, they would say, oh, those, those kids can't do that. One of the books I asked for a series was on Shakespeare. It was locked up in the school uh, where they keep all the books. And I said, but I want those books for my school students. So the principal said, well, you can, but they can't learn. That's because the expectation for Black kids has always been low. And the standardized tests they found out later were culturally biased. They would ask questions of urban kids that had no knowledge of farming, no knowledge of Europe. They had not traveled. So they could not answer those questions. So they were ranked lower. Why is that important? Because by the fourth grade, on the fourth grade standardized test, they could determine, meaning the government, the state, the educators, the politics, the politicians, would build their prisons based on the fourth grade reading score. So if you look at prison and look at the composition of those that are in it, we make up the majority. We meaning our men, the majority in the men's prison, are students who did not read, did not graduate eighth grade. So illiteracy puts you in the system to re-enslave you. So emotional intelligence says, that doesn't have to be the case because whether you have this defined credible IQ or you're just average, you can take an average IQ and supersize it like what McDonald's did with French fries or hamburgers. You can supersize the human mind and people who otherwise were not accepted as quote scholarship and intelligent the way that the Europeans defined it, the way the school systems are set up, could now look at themselves with a different lens and say, wait a minute, what about Quincy Jones? What about Michael Jackson? What about Prince? What about Etta Scott? These people had tremendous talent. But you see, what they said about us was, well, those people can sing, those people can dance, but that's not intelligence. But we find out that it is. It is not just about literature, which is my specialty. I have three degrees in English lit and writing. I always understood that. I can't dance a lit and I have the musical talent of a dead turtle. But the point is, that does not define who I am. It means that emotional intelligence 2.0, the seminal work produced by Bradbury and Greece in 2009, was a great work. The four basics of social intelligence or emotional intelligence is self-management. Managing oneself is the ability to be stable, clear, focused, and transparent, be consistent and accountable for all your actions. Self-awareness, to be able to accurately perceive one's skills and knowledge, values and responsibilities, confident in what you know you know. I stole that from you, George. Self-regulation is controlling the ability to control one's emotions, desires, and behavior in order to achieve positive outcome. Here's a big one, self-motivation. The ability to self-ignite, motivate, regardless of circumstances and who's in your corner to cheer you on. Empathy. Empathy is not in the management, but it's high on the, the emotional intelligence EQ. Empathy is different from sympathy. Sympathy says, I feel so sorry for you. Empathy says, I feel you. 
been there, done that. Bought the T-shirt, got the hat, wrote the book, starred in the movie. I understand you. I connect with your pain. So that's great stuff. I've been reading it for years, been teaching it for years, until I had my own paradigm shift. So um, Social Intelligence or Emotional Intelligence by Bradbury and the work by Daniel Coleman, it's wonderful work. It's wonderful work. I don't deny the scholarship involved in this. But like the school system, it leaves out a tremendous amount of discussion about how that applies to Blacks. What does it look like for us? So, you know, you just we just can't only take what they say. We have to come up with our own paradigm shift about what does emotional intelligence look like on us? What does it look like on Brother Bedford? What does it look like on JR? What does it look like on Emmerich Peace? What did it look like on Malcolm? What did it look like for Martin Luther King? It was different. It was different because our level of emotional intelligence is based on our history, on our history. So let me say something, folks. Mm -hmm. I wanna congratulate all of the scholars that contributed to 2.0, but they were not defined. They were not looking at us as a group with special needs. And I don't mean like special education needs, but I mean needs based on our history in America and what has been denied us, and yet we rise. So it provides meaningful strategies. I went over them with you. But our history of slaves in this country requires a paradigm shift to a unique perspective for culturally defined emotional intelligence. Mm. First slave ships arrived in Virginia in 1619. Emancipation Proclamation in 1891 was signed, activated in 1892, and then in 1865, an amendment to the Constitution sealed the deal. We were, quote, free. So from 1619 to 1892 is 272 years in literal slavery and entrapment by legislation. We were chattel. 1892 to 220 is 128 years. That's a total of 401 years of slavery in chains to slavery without visible chains. So tonight we will discuss cultural competent, emotional intelligence 4.01, the black version of what it takes to be emotionally intelligent. My research and observations are directly linked to my experience as an educator and my three score and 10 years on this earth because I am now an elder. And elders have distinct insight. They have lived long enough to digest the situation. And if they have studied and they've read and they are out there in the hedges and the byways dealing with our people, they have their empirical research. You see a lot of research done at Harvard were people that were sent to look at us and they defined us by what they saw by their intermittent interactions. Our research as elders in black is imperial because we have been there. We have sat in those seats. We have been to Harlem. We have that whole experience. George and I went to Africa. We visited the slave, the slave prison. It was a remarkable journey, but it cemented in my mind the struggles of our people. So how does emotional intelligence 4.01, based on our 401 years of slavery, both defined and then covered up, and we were said we were free, and we did get some freedom. I don't ever want to go back. I don't ever want to remember what our ancestors went through. But I do know this that we are a special people because we shouldn't be here. We shouldn't be here. We should be crazy. We should be crazy. We should not have built the pyramids before. So we come from a legacy of learning and we moved into a legacy of 
unlearning because they wouldn't allow it for us. So I define my uh, uh, definition of emotional intelligence with these three comments. It's the trauma, the drama, and the comma. So the trauma by Webster is emotional shock following a stressful event or physical injury which may be associated with physical shock that often leads to long-term neurosis. I want you to remember that. Webster defines drama as a play for theater, radio, or television, an exciting, emotional, unexpected series of events or set of circumstances. My definition of drama in emotional intelligence 4.10 is reoccurring physical, psychological, spiritual, and financial deprivation acted out upon the souls of black, feet, of black people. My definition of trauma is shock due to an effort by our slave masters to completely annihilate our sense of self, community, by any means necessary. When, you, when the Bible says, spare the rod and spoil the child, well, we have been spared no rods. And the children of those slave owners and the children of the slaves saw their fathers and their parents and their mothers whipped and tortured. So that's ingrained in our system. Now the comma. Webster, used to, Webster says it's used to separate clauses when they are joined by any of these seven conjunctions. Basically, it means by an and, a but, a for, a us, a nor, or a yet. My definition for emotional intelligence 4.10 is used to separate us from these seven components of humanity, faith, self-community, scholarship, wealth, health, and independence, and interdependence. We, as a people, are not new to pandemics. No big thing for us, because if we think about it, we have lived and moved and breathed in a state of pandemic, internal and physical and outward and political and spiritual chaos. Infected with the disease of racism, entrapped with social isolation from the mainstream, torched by a legal system that often fails to protect us from those who enforce the law according to our race. Are we angry? Beyond describing. We are burning with rage. We are on fire. So let me digress for a moment and give you an example of, of, a, of, of a story that is true that absolutely turned me upside down. Now, if I ask the people in the audience, how many of you are afraid of fire? Most everybody would raise their hand. When we think of fire other than cooking or a campfire, when you say, oh, a house is on fire, people get scared. When tornadoes start fires, we are scared by the rages of fire. But I want to tell you a story, folks. I want to tell you an emotional intelligence story. So, August 5th, 1949, in the state of Montana raged a forest fire. It was the hottest, hottest degrees ever reported in that state. It was 97 degrees in Montana. They got news that, that the forest at the Man Gulch location was on fire. So they had a very unique force out there. They were called fire jumpers. And so these men were flown 120 miles to the fire. They parachute down into the location where it is safe, but they can see the fire that is raging. Also, their, their, their supplies are dropped down, but it's scattered all over because the plane can't lower uh, close enough to the ground, cannot move a, put it in one place. So the first thing they have to do and the head of them, the foreman, was Wag, Wag Dodge. He was the foreman, 15-year firefighter, very successful, very astute man, very quiet man. So he tells his crew, which is 15, 
I want you to gather up all the tools and supplies, and I'm heading up to the gulch to meet with the one forest ranger intern that's there that's been reporting this fire and trying to, 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 to manage it for several hours by himself. He gets to the, to the gulch. The guy tells him this fire is, is really out of control. And, but Wag, at that time, is very confident. He said, oh, I'm going to go back and get my men. So he goes back at 4 o'clock is when he met with the guy on the hill uh, in the gulch. He goes back, he gets his men, he tells them we're ready to go. They grab all their tools, they have ax and shovels. Two men had a saw, I want you to remember, had a saw. This stuff is heavy. And they have something to eat and they head toward the fire. They jumped in the fire, I want you to remember that because there's an analogy that I'm coming back to. So. Dodge tells them to get close to the fire, but before they can do it, there is what is called a blow up. The winds are so torrent that the fire begins to pick up at a speed of 600 miles a minute. Now, the fire is at the, in the gulch, at the lower part of the gulch, and it's coming behind them. So he, they dodge in that moment did not know what to do. He took a moment, he took out a match and lit it and started a fire on the grassy knoll where he was. He told his men, come, join me in the center of the fire. They said, hell no. And they started to run. He lay down, put a wet uh, um, towel over his face and waited. He'd never done this before. He didn't even know where he got it from. The fire came up to where he was. The men were running down. He was laying on this grassy knoll with his head down. The force of the fire and the wind was so torrent that it lifted him up three times and shook him like he was a rag doll in the middle of this circle of fire that he set and dropped him back down to the ground. The men are running. He's laying on the ground. All of this happened in 10 minutes. But when the fire reached him, it had nothing to burn on because he had burned all of the area around him, thinking if the fire can't burn because I've burned everything, it's going to skip over me. And that's exactly the fire jumped over the area that he had burned and continued behind him. When the 10 minutes was up, he got up. He ran down to try to find his men. And when he found them, 11 of them were dead. They could not outrun the fire. So what is the point in this? How did this man think of this? What level of intelligence did he have in a crisis that you start a fire to stop a fire? You start a fire to stop a fire. This is the pandemic that Black people are in. How do we start a fire? And what they call that in fire history was an escape fire. You have to set an escape fire to stop the fire. How do we stop the decimation of our people? What do we do? What are we thinking? And I don't mean by burning our own neighborhoods. I don't mean by taking down our stores and destroying everything that's in our neighborhood. That's the wrong thing to do. To set an escape fire is to become aware of who you are. Understand the trauma in your life. We are reacting out of brokenness, out of anger that turns to rage and burns us up from the inside out. Our people are so angry. So what caused this event in this pandemic? Well, we all know, we all know it was the killing of George Floyd. We watched from the videos that for eight minutes, that policeman kept his knee on the neck of the brother. And we could hear him screaming, I can't breathe. Well, in a fire, it's noted 
that what kills most people is the smoke and the toxic gases, but not in a forest fire, not in a forest fire. Very few people ever die from that. They die because of the heat, because when trees burn, they don't let off toxic gases. And somehow, because of his 15 years of experience in fires, he pulled up that knowledge. So what knowledge must we pull up in this pandemic when we are on fire? Where is the escape fire? What must we build? Well, yes, we must build self-management. But what does that look like for us as Black people? Before the pandemic, how many books did you read? How much scholarship did you do? How much of your history do you know? How much of it do you practice? What have you done for your community? Or are you one man still operating out of the deprivation that we knew as slavery? What are you doing? Are you a fire jumper? Now we've had fire jumpers metaphorically in the black race. We've had our people that jumped in. They jumped in in different ways, but they went into the fire. W.B. Du Bois. Malcolm, Martin, Abernathy, Young, Julian Bond, Rosa Parks, Sojourner Truth, Susan B. Anthony. These were our fire jumpers. They jumped in the fray and said, I'll be damned. I'll be damned. Kill me if you want to, but I'm not going down on my knees. The only time us as Black people should be on our knees is when we're praying, because there's no more powerful knee than a bended knee. And so, uh, uh, Kavanaugh, yes, I think I got that name right, the, 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 the player, he put up one knee and lost everything. They excommunicated for one knee, but the two knees that were on the neck of George Floyd did not matter. So all needs are not created equal. But as Black folks, we are deeply spiritual. We have an emotional intelligence 4.01. We have it. We have that musical talent. We have done it in the fields of slavery. That's how we got free. The master thought we were just singing old Negro spirituals. There were a lot of messages slaves were talking to one another through that music. They were giving each other signals. Swing low, sweet chariot. Maybe that meant somebody was escaping the night. Keep your head low. The brother's on the run. So they knew how to build an escape fire. Everything that we have, that we need, is in us. It's in us. We are an unbelievable people if we would just believe it ourselves, if we would stop crying and whining and complaining, take your complaint and put some feet on it. That is what we have to do as a black people. And most of it, we have to believe in the power of unity. The brothers at the Olympics that held their hand up with the black glove, you saw what that did. The minute black people unite, the world sees it as a fire and they got to put it out. They got to put it out. So we should carry our own fire hoses, meaning the holes of connection, the holes of communication, the holes of involvement. We need to spray and keep ourselves cool and calm and don't go with the rage and do what that man did, wedge, dodge. Now, what is so similar to that in the pandemic of the world that we're experiencing globally is all of us had to put our mask on. Oh, you had to have that mask on because you didn't know if it was going your nose, if you want to breathe it in. It was an invisible virus. We have no cure for it yet. We have no cure. But racism has been like that virus. 
It has been so we put on our masks, we have to put on our gloves, we can't touch anything, don't kiss your wife, don't pet your dog, don't turn your doorknob, walk around with hand sanitizer, and I take a pause. The new currency, when this thing first hit in the shutdown, the new, if you had some hand, hand sanitizer and some toilet paper, brother, you were in. That was the new currency of the, of the uh, pandemic. So the point for us is, how do we follow the jumpers, those people that went before us and that, will, that set the stage to quell the fire and to bring about change? You think Martin wanted to do what he did? He was a preacher. He was drafted by his anointing and by his people. He was young. He was 26 years old. Who wants to jump in a fire like that? But he did it. Rosa Parks, a deliberate. Wasn't no accident when she said, I'm tired. I'm not sitting in the back of the bus. Are some of us still in the back of the bus? Are we still in the back of the bus? Do you take your seat when you should stand? Do you take your seat when you should stand? We must unite around the fire that is burning in us. It's a fire that will come and deliver us. Meaning this, if you look at forestry, which I study, do you know that forest fires are a way of cleansing the forest? They don't tell you that. They even have, it's part of the, 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 uh, the, the plantation, uh, the planting of new crops and trees is they do a control burn. They deliberately burn. They don't tell you about that because some far, far, uh, far station, uh, some plants can only release their seeds under the fire, under the fire. That's how they populate. So this fire for us should not burn us up. It should have us release the seeds, the seeds of unity, the seeds of knowledge, the seeds of controlling the trauma, but first understanding it. If you understood the real workings of trauma, you would know this. Trauma releases, which is a shock, releases a chemical in the body. You're gonna do one of three things. You're gonna fight, you're gonna take flight, or you're gonna freeze. Because the hormones that are released are there to give you that super surge. Because when you're in trauma, you're really at the highest level of power, believe it or not. But if you don't know how to control your thinking, you'll just go with the hormonal release without having the brain release, which means what should I do? Catch me in an alley. What should I do? push me down in the street, search me, drag me out of my car. You got to know that you have to have that controlled burn. Yes, you're angry. Why the hell are they pulling me out of my car? Why, 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 why when I reach for my wallet, they take me to the police station and they brutalize me? Why are our brothers being shot on the street, our young men? when they're reaching for a box of M&Ms and the policeman says, oh, I thought he had a gun. So black people shouldn't eat candy. Black people shouldn't walk. And a black man should never run in the street because he must have done something. And now I ask you this, I guess we shouldn't breathe. The, the world tells us we should not breathe, but we breathe anyway. So with this pandemic that's evident in our lives, and we've been living with it, we are the victims of the Holocaust. And one thing I will say for our Jewish brothers and sisters, they keep it on TV. You never forget what happened. We had roots, yes, in the 1980s. That turned us around. That was our first look at ourselves through slavery on TV. What do we have? What do we have? Where are our new leaders? We need them because if they kill our men, they kill our people. Our men, men are the strength of their, of, the, of their families, of their nation, of their people. They have certain inalienable rights given to them by God. 
they lead that that's why they go after them give me a good black brother and i will show you a kingdom builder i will show you a kingdom builder give me a strong black sister and i will show you what motherhood looks like but we have been disenfranchised separated our men been taken out of the homes because of welfare that was the first thing they said man can't be in the house man can't be in the house man can't be in the house otherwise if the man stays then maybe you might get off wealthy i'm not talking about the bad brother that don't tend to work so fire exists in every revolution fire exists in war fire exists in everything that is going to bring about change but it can be a cleansing for us as a people if you control your emotions think does this just what do i want do i want to just burn the park do i want to burn our buildings or do i want to set on fire myself metaphorically so that i can be activated so that my highest power, my highest good, my calling can come out of me in a positive way. We all have stoves. But there are times when you go to get a pot that you've been cooking and you don't have that, that, that um, pot cover or that the, 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 hold the handle, you'll burn yourself. So uncontrolled, it's no good. So we are, you know how they say you have fire in your belly? That's a good thing. When that, that brother, that sister got fired, that means they got something. They got that it factor, that intelligence factor that helps them move through the fight. We're a, we need to be fire jumpers. So what the result of what Wag Dodge did at Man Gulch in, on August 5th, 1949, revolutionized the industry. They didn't know that before he did it. He didn't even know but he had a control of his intelligence in a crisis. Now he's in a crisis. The fire is moving at 600 feet a minute. How close is the fire to us? It's on TV. It's every time we see one of our people killed unnecessarily. So our intelligence must take us past what has been written and take us to the history of us. What does self-management, self-motivation, they call it self-control, but for us, it must be control thyself, manage thyself, motivate thyself, because we have to make it personal in order for it to ignite what we need inside of each of us. Each of us carries within us a nation. We carry the DNA of our ancestors. Each of us is a planet revolving around the other. We all have the sun and the moon and the stars and the flow and the brains and the organs and the eyes and the ears and the hands to work. To be conscious of what we do as a people, how we talk to each other, and how we talk to our children. And just more than talk is what do we live? What do we live? What examples, what legacy? Now I'm in the legacy, the legacy building age. I'm thinking about when I'm gone. I bought a book, list all your assets, it said, when I'm gone, you write down everything, give the book, to your children or who's ever going to inherit from you. And if you don't have money, can they inherit wisdom? If you don't have houses, can you house inside of them all of the wisdom that you have acquired? So everybody has an inheritance to leave. Don't just think it's cash. Don't just think it's cash. Malcolm didn't have money to leave to his wife and his five daughters but he left a legacy. Martin didn't have a lot of money, but he left a legacy. So what do you want to leave? Well, you can't leave what you never, what you never stored. What do you want to leave? Are you worried about grandma's pearls? That's wonderful. 
But what about the pearls of wisdom? What about the jewels that you have dug from the earth of your own knowledge, the seeds that you have planted? What are we leaving? So legacy is built when you have put a leg up. That's when you're alive. The dead don't put a leg up. When you're alive, that's your leg up to create a legacy. Are you in the fray or are you frozen? Now, this happens to all of us. We are not all where we are and used to be. But if you're not about transformation and you talk about, well, we're poor and we're disenfranchised, that's true, but a lot of our black people have money. What do we do with it? Do we contribute? Do we give? Do we serve? Do you have somebody or a group in your group that you help financially? I know it sounds crazy, folks, but if you don't give no money, how strong is your testimony? If you don't have nothing to give and your hand is always out, what are you doing? So if you are a carpenter, leave some sculpture. Leave something, take pictures of what you did. So a legacy is not just, I got this, I got this, I got this. Have a biography of your life. That's what I'm doing. Have a biography. So when my eyes are closed, my influence is even stronger. Because I don't have to speak because my works will speak for me. But no work, no legacy. No, no finances, you can have a legacy. But don't get me wrong. Once you understand emotional intelligence 4.0, the trauma, the drama, and the comma, and the comma is this. We can put a comma in the trauma and the drama and say, and, or because, or yet. So it's not finished for us. The pandemic hasn't finished us. It won't. We have lost people in it. And it has affected the Black community. Do you know why? I've studied this. Because traditionally, we have the poorest health system, and we don't go when we do. You can't drag a Black man to a doctor most of the time. So we are already weakened in our health perspective, so it hits us first. And the lower you are on the socioeconomic scale, the less you have taken care of yourself. It's not because we're weak in the pandemic and the virus is coming, the coronavirus is coming after us. We've been weakened by our experience. So I want to say this. Where is your fire? Where is your escape fire? What are you burning up so that you don't burn up? What, what is around you that you're getting rid of so that you can lay on clean land? that you can lay and set out a, a, an environment for yourself, create an ecosystem that produces. Because the fires in the forest that are set restore the ecosystem and the balance in the forest. It's done every year all over controlled burn. Where's your controlled burn? Just enough so that you respond with those IQ, EQ, management styles for us because we're angry. We're angry. I'm angry. I'm angry. Now, I'm going to say this. George and I both might have had special privilege because we didn't get enough chocolate in the sauce. So we could go places and do things and be accepted before they knew who we were. And we were in. And the next thing they know, we weren't in the back of the bus. We was running the bus and they didn't know what to do with us. So we've had some favor, but you know why we got it? You know why we got it? So we could tell you what goes on behind closed doors. It wasn't just so we could be light and have straight hair. We had a purpose and an anointing. And when we found it out, that's what we be about. So don't look at me and, and accuse me of being too fair to care. Let me tell you what I don't have on the outside I have it on the inside, and that's what matters. Beauty is only skin deep. It's only skin deep. How deep is the river that runs through our soul? How deep is the color that makes us whole? It's the blackness and the awareness in the mindset. You want to be transformed? Embrace who you are, but know who you are. Deal with your woundedness. Deal with your brokenness. 
Deal with your tragedies and your triumphs. Deal with your scars and turn them into scars. Take your mess and turn it into a miracle. And it's possible because the legacy before said it can be done. This is a continual fight. Racism isn't over. It will never be over. But we don't have to stay in the spot. We don't have to stay. 2020 is not where we should be in 2021. I have lived most of my life. I will not see what young people will see. I didn't see what my ancestors saw. That's okay. That's why we have history books. That's why we do that. Study to show thyself approved, the scripture said. Not just the scriptures, but everything connected to humanity. Look at it. Learn. And learn some of the skills of meditation and mindfulness. Think about your thinking, metacognition. How do you think and why do you think? Why do you think the way you think? Where did you get that opinion from? Where did you get that perspective? Question everything. Be attached to nothing until it's proven to be effective in your life, not by yourself, but by those people who you influence. We all influence people. Who is in your circle of influence? Who is it? Who do you hang and who hangs with you? So if you set your fire, you control it. You control thyself. You manage thyself. You study. You believe in scholarship. And don't say that scholarship is talking white. It's not talking white. They stole it from us. So what are they talking? What are they talking? We were building pyramids. So what are they talking? We're not talking white. We're talking truth. And if I happen or you happen to speak the king's English, good. Because then you can get into the king's court and find out how to overthrow it in the only way that we can. One step at a time with emotional intelligence for Black folks. Culturally appropriate, culturally defined, redefined to take into account who we are so we can become who we will be. And will be is a continuum. It will go on long after I'm gone. But for those of you with young children, teenagers, whoever you can teach, whoever you can teach, reach one, teach one. Sounds like an old adage. But you know, some stuff you don't have to improve on. But I will do this. They say that you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Well, you can't teach a dog, but you can teach a human. So don't take a dog adage and apply it to yourself. That's my pet peeve. And on that note, I'm going to leave you with this statement. Einstein said that a problem cannot be resolved at the level in which it was created. Meaning, that it is unlikely if you created the problem, you could solve it. Well, I'm going to redefine that for emotional intelligence 4.01. Oh, yes, you can. It's our problem and we can solve it. Because and nobody's going to solve it for us. But we solve it by accessing what is available, interpreting for how we need it. Don't believe all it, like this other statement. If it's not broke, don't fix it. Oh, that means if you got a good job and you're living nice and the pandemic didn't fix you, nothing broken. When one brother or sister is broken, you're broken because we're connected by the DNA chain called humanity and race and culture. When they put George on the ground and was on his neck, he, they were on the neck of every black person. If you think that some of this isn't coming to a theater near you, wait till the lights go on. And I'm sure it has affected us. But the thing that we have in the pandemic, it's a wonderful thing, folks. I know you think that may sound crazy, but it's our opportunity. We can now protest and we put the mask on in the street, but I encourage you to take the mask off at home and look at yourself. Who are you? We've been wearing masks for years, Black people but we need to take it off at home. You've got the time, you've got the rationale. Here's the reason. When you emerge from this pandemic and it's starting to open up now, but that didn't mean the virus went away. 
You ought to come out of there like a bear out of hibernation. Smarter, brighter, more focused. Don't say, I can't wait to get out and go to Walmart. That is not what this should be about. I can't wait to get out and connect with my brother and sisters. I can't wait to go to the library and get that book. Cause now we got time. We got the time, we got the case, we got the environment. Seize the moment, seize it, seize it. We are a great and mighty people. No excuses will satisfy. We're in a pandemic, make your escape fire and I'll see you on the ridge when I lay down with my mask on my face, cause it ain't gonna get me, cause I'm prepared. Now. Is that your story is sticking, and you're sticking to it? That's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> and brother, I, you, huh? you can see, you, you only need to ask Emma one question. <laughs> right? Yes, <laughs> yes, I, I, I had four or five prepared. Right, so I asked her one question. I don't know how she knew uh, the answers to all the other questions that I had prepared, but she did it in one answer. But that was great, that, that was great, Emma. Um, Brother Bedford, do you have any questions or anything from our audience? Is there anything you wanna ask before I close out? Because she know, took us right to eight o'clock. Yeah, we're, we're, we're right there, George. I just want to, Thank Emma. Thank you so much, Emma, for uh, bringing the fire. Right? You you use that that phrase a lot tonight, uh, and of course, imploring us to uh, make sure that we kindle our fire. But if, if we needed a spark, I think you gave that to us tonight. So you brought the fire, and I think you lit us up. And so all of the hearts and all of the comments that I'm I'm seeing, everyone is extremely excited and thankful for your commentary tonight. So I just want to say thank you. And, but I do uh, want to say this, Brother Bedford, I really forgot because I was in my moment. I do teach emotional intelligence for Black folks 4.01. So if they want to connect with me, can you please post my number? Is that possible? Sure. We can post with my number. We'll make it's, sure to put the number in the comments. So, and go ahead. And okay, get they it. can set, should I give it now? Yeah, go ahead and give it. 718-916-3952. That's 718-916-3952. And my email address is Audrey Fraser at yahoo.com. I'll spell that. A-U-D-R-E-E-F-R-A-S-E-R -E 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 at yahoo.com. Audrey, A-U-D-R-E-E-F-R-A-S-E-R -E 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 at yahoo.com. For the first 10 people that call, I will give a 15-minute consultation, uh, cons uh, consultation and a preview on what we will be covering in that three-month uh, course of study. Great. Um... On Thursday, we have Dr. Terrence Cash. Uh, I feel sorry for him that he has to follow this sermon, because this was a sermon tonight. You know, my sister's an ordained minister, and so I think she preached and teached tonight. Most definitely, most right? definitely. She was preaching and teaching, and you never interrupt a preacher when they're in their zone. And Emma said she was in her zone. And so I just remained silent. Um, for those of you that want to uh, want to take advantage of the Power Network and conf uh, conference offer, you know what it is. It's a $1,900 discount on a $2,300 package that includes one adult and one student. Instead of paying $2,300, you pay $399, you can find out all about the conference on powernetworkingconference.com. That's powernetworkingconference.com. Forbes magazine named it one of the top five conferences in America not to be missed October the 14th through the 17th in Houston. Yes, it's been rescheduled. That's when it's going to be. We'll see you there. If you want to take advantage of that offer, 
you know it's only good for the first five people. Email me at gfraser at frasernet.com. gfraser, F-R-A-S-E-R, at frasernet.com. Say I'm in in the subject line. Put your full name and cell number in the body of the email. All emails are timestamped. The first five people will get $1,900 off the $2,300 package, $2, package of one adult and one student. So that's one adult and one student, 17 to 25. Okay, first five people. So that's our offer for, for tonight. Um, I want to close and pivot, with a pivot, a little bit of pivot on the knowledge uh, that that my sister uh, sermonized tonight. Um, and this is something I said once before, but I want to repeat it, and I want to give a little bit of biblical text to you on a very popular um, passage in the Bible from Hosea. But it was Socrates who said that the only good is knowledge and the only evil is ignorance. The only good is knowledge and the only ignorance is evil. Hosea 4 verse 6, you know the first part of this, but you don't know the last part of it because you haven't read the whole thing. My people perish for the lack of knowledge. You know that. Read the rest of the sentence, brothers and sisters. Because thou has rejected knowledge, I also reject you. Thou shalt be no priest to me. If you are not learned, if you do not seek knowledge, there would be no one that you can advise. And even God rejects you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's our thought for this evening. Emma, what a beautiful sermon you gave us tonight. Mm -hmm. You set the tone uh, for us to have much to think about in the coming days. Brother Bedford, as usual, with your awesome bow tie, <laughs> right? Love it. I love it. I love it. It looks so proper and so, and actually it looks fresh, right? <laughs> it looks fresh. So and um, it's sort of the the new intelligence, you know, the yes. outward yes. projection of knowledge, right? So, Brothers and sisters, thank you so much for being with us tonight. We've run over. <clears throat> I couldn't stop my sister. Uh, <laughs> help today. And uh, we'll see you on Thursday night, 7 o'clock, mm -hmm. with Dr. Terrence Cash. Mm -hmm. We'll be talking about all things money. Mm -hmm. God bless you. We'll see you in, what, 48 hours. Have a mm -hmm. good evening. Thank you, Brother Vepper. Thank you, Emma. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.